uh, you got me? Yep. Uh, I'm usually not intimidated to, uh, to read an introduction, but uh, uh, my next uh, guest, uh, Mr. Glenn Kaufman, has uh, quite a list to his credit, um, of which we won't go through the entire list. But if you're interested, please see me. Uh, but he's the co-owner, uh, most recently, he's the co-owner of uh, Pure American Naturals, which uh, with select collaborators produces superior quality yarns and finished textile products. He's a 10th generation lifelong farmer with broad livestock experience. Um, Glenn, with his son Mark, owns and operates the 190 acre corn, soybean, alfalfa, hay, and 300 head Angora goat farm in Perry County, Pennsylvania, that is home to Pure American Naturals. Glenn and Pan's focus is developing relationships and markets in the fashion textile world. Um, he's previously was the director of the Penn State Department of Farm Operation and Services and initiated and developed Penn State's Food Waste Compost Center. And he was also instrumental in forming relationships between agricultural industries and Penn State uh, to research the use of biomass derived alternative fuels. Uh, also championing farmer grown fuels and green lubricants, he originated the university's use of biodiesel and began and coordinated the conversion of the university to biohydraulic fluids. Also started a program for seed crop production and processing into biofuels. Please uh, let me help me welcome uh, Mr. Glenn Kaufman. Hey, thanks a lot. I uh, apologize for giving too much information. Uh, and uh, I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have all you interested in, in cup plants. Um, I, I think we have to recognize that now we're, uh, we're moving to a completely a different part of the United States. And, um, and now, you know, think about going into the northern United States and eastern United States. And, and we're looking for some of those plants that may not be uh, our typical plants that we use. And so in, in northern U.S., alfalfa, hay, silage, corn silage, and perennial grasses have been a long, a long tradition of, of supplying the forage needs of our dairy and our meat production industries. However, recently, the hazards of relying on only a few plant species have, uh, the, were, brought, were brought to the forefront because of drought and flooding, and drought and, uh, and, and way too much moisture. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania, where we normally have 40 inches of rainfall, and this year we've had and, and it's not even the end of the year yet, we have in the 70s inches of rainfall. And so it's been my interest to look at some of the novel forages, some of the other plants that haven't been uh, really explored too much uh, as far as forage plants. And uh, my partner, Dr. Judith Shoemaker, um, and I have um, a herd of 300 Angora goats. And we are constantly seeking high protein feed. The Angora goat needs uh, a 20% protein on a dry matter basis of a total ration. And that might be one of the highest protein needs of our uh, domestic livestock. And so I, we're looking for something that can really produce protein but, but keep them out there grazing uh, much of the time of the time. And so we're recognizing in this, uh, in this state of depending only on a few species w that we have that risk that comes along with, only, with not much diversity that maybe some other species could, could fill some niches. And so um, there's many of these and uh, at the end of my slides yeah, I might l list some of them that I'm working with. But today we're going to talk about cup plant, and cup plant is a robust, long-lived perennial. I established cup plant in 1997, and it is every bit as strong and as dense and as high-yielding as, as it has been in the last 11 years. Um, no, that's 
26, yeah. Many, it, it's, ver, it's very long-lived. And uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it, it's a Ford. It's a broadleaf. And it's called cup plant because the leaves form a, a cup that holds water. And that water is there for birds or uh, insects. And it also is exceptionally high in protein. So as we are looking for at least a 20% protein ration in our grazing swords, uh, this, th this one is one of the highest protein plants that we have to choose from. And this is the data uh, of my uh, forage analysis, and it's 26% protein, and that is not different from other uh, Penn State Extension colleagues who have tested it, and even the data that's on the internet. And uh, so, you know, it, it's typically in that in that range in all the data. You and you can look this up on the internet with uh, just typing in cup plant. You'll get a lot of research. There's been a lot of research. But it doesn't seem that the research reaches the on the ground, you know, boots on the ground. And so uh, it is uh, an interesting plant, and it's native. It's a native plant, and it's native to eastern half the, of North America. And you will find it growing along some streams and rivers. Uh, and uh, the Indians used it for medicine. But we're using it because it's high protein and it is really long lived. So it's, it's exceptionally winter hardy. Some of the data is saying that it's been proven winter hardy even at 22 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. And I can say I never saw any winter damage in Pennsylvania. And it will grow in wet spots, but it will also grow on droughty ground. And I'll show you a slide after a bit that has some of it on some of, some of my thin soils. So I was looking um, for an enterprise that could use some of my marginal land, and that's how I got started with these Angora goats. I'm also looking, I was looking for an enterprise where I could uh, get away from grown commodities. And tomorrow morning, I'm, talk, I'm giving another talk about this thing of, um, of producing products versus commodities. So we can talk more about Angora goats if you'd like. But please, in, in, this, in this setting today, ask questions as they come to your mind. I'd like, I'd like to have a discussion kind of, uh, ki a kind of discussion during this time period. And if you have a question, just raise your hand or shout it out. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, excellent pollinator plant. Yeah, ex excellent ecological thing for for uh, those butterflies and and bees. Um, it I like it too because it is the one of the first things to grow in the spring, and so as as a grazing thing, working with about 19 paddocks with our herd. Um, I don't like them all to be mature at the same time, so I, I, I'm a real keen fan of diversity of paddocks, paddocks with different species, but I'm also very keen about diversity within paddocks, but you'll see that with cup plant, there isn't much diversity because it really takes over. Um, so uh, there's data on the internet. You can look it up. There's data that shows um, Forage yields are compatible, are very comparable to corn silage. You know, we're talking about 20 tons per acre fresh made into silage. So uh, it grows about the same time that dandelion grows in the spring. And if you look at the background of some of those photos, you see uh, grass pastures or pastures with different uh, blends of grass and legumes, and they are just beginning to turn green. And uh, w we already have some 
enough growth there to turn turn in the first grazing, get put the animals in for the first grazing, and uh, so I, I like that because it gives me a diversity of of uh, pasture management because not everything is mature at the same time, and and this is just kind of a uh, uh, a whole group of photos, but. Uh, you can see with the smiles on their faces that they really like it. And I think I, I got interested, well, first of all, Calvin Ernst, uh, a breeder of, uh, of native, uh, native plant species in Meadville, Pennsylvania, um, suggested I try this and start and, and try a paddock or two of, of cup plant. And he became interested in it because he was somewhere on a farm where the cattle got out and got into the standing corn and the cattle walked by the standing corn to eat the cup plant at the side of the field. Uh, Calvin has done quite a bit of uh, travel and there's quite a bit of research being done in Russia using a native plant of North America. So it has, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the virtues of cup plant as we go through and, and one of them is that it, it has uh, is proven anthelmetic, and for two reasons, and, and we all know the the, the worm cycle, uh, the nematodes, and they only crawl up a plant three, four, five inches, and so if the, if these animals are grazing uh, three feet high or something like that, they're not getting many of those nematodes when they're eating, but also there is the anthelmetic effect of some plants like Theresia lespedeza and birdswood trefoil that the tannins actually uh, discourage the nematodes in livestock. So uh, there you can see they are animals that like to browse and so they don't get down low enough to get the, the nematodes when they're eating a plant like this. <coughs> so uh, um, one of the things that we can, uh, we can talk about is that they really clean it up and they strip all the leaves off of it they don't eat the big, heavy, thick stems. And the forage tests that I've done have been forage tests on the leaves. I didn't conclude the stems. So um, they, they don't waste because they don't tramp it into the ground. They just clean it up, and they seem to create their own natural grazing front, just as though we had a wire in front of them. Uh, they will, they will just clean it off and move into the new, the new area to graze. And, and it's sort of amazing to watch. It almost looks like there's a wire there that's keeping them out of the next, and they're cleaning up everything as they go. Yes. And you, and you can find that information on the internet. And, the, and research has been done by USDA, the NRCS Plant Materials Research Lab in New York State. What do they call it? Big Flats. Big Flats Research in New York State. Yes. Um, has anybody ever done dormant seeding? Okay, this is the first time for me to do a dormant seeding. Uh, seeded this in 1997, in December. Actually, it was 96, and then the first growth 
growth year was in 97. So it seemed a little bit unusual to me to get out there when the ground was almost frozen. And everything on my farm is no-till. I've been no-till since 1970. Um, and so I no-tilled it in, in December and saw it germinating and coming up very early in the spring. Um, it, it does have uh, some s more sparse growth in the first year, and there was some weeds in it the first year, but these animals that we have ate the weeds. So someone's going to ask, well, where do you get seed? And um, I, <laughs> uh, you know, Ernst Conservation Seeds introduced me to this species of forage, and I thought, I, if you're interested, you can, you can go to their website. And I really suggest that you go to your, their website because it, it is just a gorgeous website. And uh, if you click on, uh, you know, read our story, you'll get a very, uh, very detailed, uh, very interesting read uh, about these, uh, this seed company that is focused on producing the seed of native, native plant species. And it, uh, they, they, they provided all the seed for the, uh, the memorial in Pennsylvania where, the, where the, the crash, Flight 93 memorial. Uh, now, you know, that they bought up a couple thousand acres of, of farms around that, that crash site. And and uh, and put it all back into native, native plants. And here is the Ernst Conservation Seed Harvesting Cup plant. And I can't get a combine head high enough to cut it with a combine. So they have a guy out there on a man lift, picking off the mature heads, and taking them in the, into. And into the barn and running it through a gleaner combine. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's not cheap seed. It's, and, um, but it, it only takes about two pounds the acre to seed it. But yes, it is, it's not cheap seed, but I can't tell you what the price is right now. You can contact Ernst Conservation Seed if you're interested, but I know that he sells out quickly. There's, there's become a big demand for this, not only as a forage crop, but as an ornamental. So you see it sometimes in, in new landscape sites where they want a flower that is, uh, you know, a big, tall flowering plant. So it does spread, and you could, it could be called invasive. And I have seen it move from my paddock across the township road onto the neighbor's cornfield. Um, and it, it spreads by rhizomes, so if there's a, um, a thin spot in the field, it's, it, it fills in. Um, but it's easy to control with the corn and soybean sprays. My, you know, all those corn and soybean sprays just, just take it right out of the field. So it's not kind of a problem invasive, but it, it, it does spread. And it is a pollinator plant, uh, and it's a honey-producing plant. Um, and, and as I said, the, the leaves hold water. Um, you remember the, 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 the picture of, the, of harvesting the seeds? You know, with that much vegetation, you don't have weeds. I did establish uh, crown vetch, not crown vetch, hairy vetch. When I, when I seeded it, I put hairy vetch in there, and I still see a little bit of hairy vetch, but I don't see any weeds, and there's, there's no, no pests. And I asked Calvin Ernst, well, where in the world does this thing get the, its nitrogen, it's, and it's not a legume? And <coughs> he said he didn't know. But when you think about that much biomass at that high a protein, that's getting nitrogen from somewhere to make protein. And so that's kind of a mystery. I don't know the answer to that. But um, I don't fertilize it. Calvin Ernst doesn't fertilize it uh, and doesn't seem to respond to fertilizer where I've applied some manure 
can make a difference. So, uh, I'm, yes, question. Okay, I get three to four grazings per year. Now, I don't let it get to be eight feet tall. I graze it when it's about two. I start them in it at about two foot height. And, you know, till they get through the paddock in that grazing front, it gets to be about three and a half foot tall. I have, I have, the, I have the, the cup plant field broken up into several paddocks. And I try to get a rotation going um, with the, with those different paddocks, and and usually I can um, I can turn in for another grazing in about 35 days. Um, it's one of the fastest things to regrow that I've worked with, and it grows. It regrows both from axillary buds and from the crown. So when it, when the, when, when it regrows after a grazing, you see sp sprouts coming up from the crown, but you also see new leaves coming out from the axis of the old leaves. So um, <coughs> I'm, I'm a keen believer in diversity, yes. Uh, I don't believe, but it, it does spread by itself w with the wind or whatever, so I, I, I suppose you could broadcast it. I, I'm, I'm a no-till drill kind of person, and uh, so when the seed is fairly large but light, so I couldn't use a small box on the drill. I had to use a big box, and I wasn't, I didn't trust my drill enough to get it down to two pounds in the in the large seed box, so I mixed it with oats, and and um, seeded it all in no-till. I tried to seed it in the spring one time, and I didn't get much of a, a stand, but I do see that some uh, is coming now. Five years later, I see I see it's coming. So there must have been some hard seed that stayed in the soil and is coming now. And it, you know, and, com and competing with a reed canary grass pasture, so it's, you know, it, it, it you know, it, nothing holds it back. Um, I, I do know there's some data, in it, and and if you have some more questions, I'll refer to my, my partner, Dr. Judith Shoemaker, that animals do seek, what they need, and that is why I'm keen on having diversity of species within a sward, within a paddock. And so all of my paddocks have, are multi-species. And, um, and I believe that does uh, improve some animal health and productivity, but I, I know that it enhances soil health to have multi-species. But it, it, it puts a big challenge on management. Managing multi-species pastures is, is a lot more difficult than monoculture. And so th these are some of the things that I'm working with, but uh, if you are interested in any of them, um, we can talk later or talk now. But I have one question here.
Any other questions? Well, thank you all for being interested.